We don't replace things that are valuable. We don't replace things that are unique. We cherish them. We give them more money. We invest in them. At the end of the day, like if you want like security and freedom in the future, the further into that uniqueness that you can dive into, the more likely that you're going to be secure. There's a lot of ideas right now floating around about how the future of work is changing, which it definitely is changing big time. And sure. what that means for anyone who is looking to start building something or creating something using this amazing tool we have called the internet. Mm -hmm. So before, like you can go to school and you can interact with like 30 people and that was like your reality, like your social sphere. But now you can go on, on Instagram and you can interact with billions of people. And just like in real life, there's going to be things that people say who are around you that don't don't matter to you. There are going to be people who make memes and talk, tell jokes. All of that is the same on the internet. It's amplified in every single direction. And so some people are afraid of what the internet can do, but a lot of people like us or the more curious ones see it as an opportunity. If you have something to teach, if you have something to share, if you have some knowledge that's valuable, then that message can reach millions and millions of people. If you think about what, what an innovator is, like I think you kind of brought this word back to my attention. What was it, Formula One racing? So there's a group of people working together and just trying to reach the cutting edge of some area of expertise, like to push past the limits of what we think is possible with science and technology and creativity. That's pretty much what we're talking about here. But just imagine F1 is anything that you're interested in. Yeah. You have the ability to push the cutting edge of whatever you like with other people and find those people. And that's something that you just couldn't do without the internet before. And so I think of an innovator as someone who is pretty much always in high demand. And innovators are always in high demand because they are valuable to humans, right? They're valuable to other people. And they're valuable to other people because they do three things. Um, and this is also why I kind of view it, um, view innovators as the modern day teacher because as we just talked about and like how education and learning is moving online that's how the modern people are going to learn people go to the internet to learn and so the three areas <laughs> these circles are funny the, the three areas of an innovator i think the three hats they wear is one of a learner if you want to be at the cutting edge you have to research you have to learn you have to read books, you have to talk to people, you have to share ideas. The other hat that they wear though, because you can just learn and learn all day and not really make anything out of it, you have to also be a builder. So not only do they just learn, they also build resources or products. I think in this current day and age where we are, like probably some of the most popular things to build are like education products. Digital products for any innovator is there is so many there's so many benefits to having a digital product as as opposed to a physical product i guess which would be like the opposite when you think about that digital products usually have very low overhead they're very easy to make they're very easy to automate because of ai tools and stuff like that and there's a lot more customization for how you can distribute them and sell them as well whereas when you think about physical products you know you have to deal with like packaging and shipping sourcing and then you know all those other technical things and the last one uh, which hat they wear is being a leader. So to look at a leader, like we kind of have to understand human psychology a little bit better. And what do I mean by a leader? I guess we can like define leadership in so many ways, but I really love like Simon Sinek's um, definition of leaders, how leaders always start by just asking why, right? And that question itself kind of hits, hits on the aspect you were talking about and how we talked about at the beginning, which is like understanding people. So a leader understands people. The leader understands the problems of people. And that's really how you speak to them. And so if they can understand the problems of people, and then you can guide those people to solutions and the solutions that you are creating because you're also building and you're abusing what you learn to build something better, that's how all these intersect into a Venn diagram. So not only are you leading, you have to build and you have to learn. And all three of those things put you at the cutting edge of solving complex problems. I think Elon Musk had the quote that is like so good. It was like, you get paid in direct proportion to the complexity and difficulty of the problems you solve. And so that's what innovators do. They just solve really complex problems and then they're able to lead people to the solution. Yeah, I like that. So I kind of drew it out as I understood what you said. So why would anyone want to become an innovator? What is the reason? What is the draw? Why is it? so desirable, if at all. It's a new path that people can take. But at the end of the day, becoming an innovator means that you are becoming, what is that fashion term? Oh, what is that? Pocketeur. Have you heard that? No? Uh, basically, I, I think it's a French term. I don't remember what it is. It basically just means you are one of one. It's like when, like when a piece is couture, mm. it's like it is one of a kind. And it yes. was made, okay. and it's never going to be made again. And I think like 
An innovator allows you to differentiate yourself from the marketplace, I guess, like the job market from mm-hmm. society as like a unique individual because you have mm-hmm. a unique skill set because of these, right. the overlap of these three pillars right here. Because your experiences are going to determine the type of learner you are, the type of leader you are, and the type of builder you are. And no one mm-hmm. can replicate those three circles because those are all you. Um, and so it allows you to differentiate yourself from people, which is something that I think we have a lot of opinions about the traditional education system. What was that book you talked about how the traditional education system basically just churns out replicas of cogs that fit into a system? It Everyone was, learns kind of like... What was it? Seth Godin's Lynchpin? Yeah, maybe it was that one. But, um, mm-hmm. but you know how the, everyone, everyone goes to school and they all learn the same education. They yeah. all take the same classes and they have to get the same grades. And so on paper, everyone has the same information that they learn and the same credentials, right? Mm-hmm. So everyone is not one, like not individual, like they're not individualized. You're basically just like another checkbox in a in the education system. We're talking about something that's valuable and something that's unique. We don't replace things that are valuable. We don't replace things that are unique or that provide value to us. We cherish them. We give them more money. We invest in them. And at the end of the day, like if you're talking about what, if you want like security and freedom in the future, the further into that uniqueness that you can dive into, the more likely that you're going to be secure. I guess the very definition of a cog in a machine is that you want all your cogs to be exactly the same. You want them to be all identical because Mm -hmm. if one cog breaks down, then you want an identical cog to be, to take its place. So the whole machine Mm -hmm. keeps working. So Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, that is what society is. If you zoom out, like everyone is a cog in the machine and everyone Mm -hmm. is able to come in and and replace each other. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing. You want the machine of society to always be running. But Mm -hmm. now that society is changing at such a rapid pace, a lot of the traditional big machines are just not able to keep up. That's what we're seeing. Like... The educational system, for example, is a big machine with many cogs is not able to keep up with like all these new things that we have to learn. And mm-hmm. so you need to quickly build smaller machines, like machines that never existed before. The the one of one that you're talking about. Or I guess Alex Hormozzi likes to call it one of zero. Like mm-hmm. you are the one of zero, meaning real. zero has never been done before. <laughs> It's what is that? Infinity? Isn't that infinity? Infinity. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's like, when he first explained, I was like, that's cool. Like one of zero is undefined because it's right okay so undefined. undefined 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 i'm thinking of yeah. zero over one is like it there's another one yeah it's undefined yeah. pushing the boundaries and creating something that's never been created before undefined mm-hmm. so well, you can't be a cog right well i'm not even saying like being a cog is bad like obviously a lot of people prefer stability and prefer the <laughs> i don't want to call it like the cog lifestyle right but there are some people who don't want to don't want that life and mm-hmm. it before was always like really scary because the opportunity or like didn't seem like it was there to start something, you know, like I think a long time ago when someone was like, I want to start my own business. Mm-hmm. That's like a, such a scary idea. It's just not very clear the path you can take to do that. Or now with the internet and like with AI and with technology and with so many other people doing it, it is a lot more clear. It's just not mm-hmm. like what is normally pushed to us when we're younger. What I'm seeing is... This is like a very monumental, this is a massive transfer of wealth in society right now, where money is all moving in this direction from from a certain uh, sector of the community, a certain sector of the society to someone else. So like there's this wealth transfer, right? Mm -hmm. And there's cogs here and this new this is this represents like the new the new world the cogs here are eventually going to have to all come over here too right so this new machine is going to have like new co- all these cogs here are going to go here so like who is going to stand to make the most money and opportunity it's going to be the people who go first right the people who pave the way and the people who create areas for the for the cogs to come over after mm. yeah innovators are coming first they're the early adopters they're the person who are paving the way and making room for everyone else to come over so since they are the first into this zone of like the unknown they're going to be hit by the wealth transfer the hardest yeah I don't know. eventually yeah. everything becomes a commodity that's a very simple way to say it yes 
before things can become a commodity, they're, they're a novel. And the ones mm -hmm. who can provide a novel solution first can charge the most for it. We should probably be clear that not everyone is cut out to even be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Not everyone is cut out to be a creator. So mm -hmm. I think that the ratio still stands. It's like not everyone is cut out to be an innovator. And I think that most people, if you're watching this podcast or you're watching us talk about this, then you're part of a small group of people that are interested. Mm -hmm. I think the vast majority right. of people are still not ready. Their mindset is not there because at the end of the day, being an entrepreneur or being an innovator, it takes a lot of risk. Mm -hmm. It's very high risk. It's a high risk life. You have to put yourself out there. You have to face a lot of fears. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the people who take the biggest risks are the ones who make the biggest change. And they're the ones who impact the most people. Yeah, I agree. Because it's like, if you don't do one of them, then you won't successfully innovate. You can learn all you want. But if you don't build anything with it, then you can't help anybody. If you know how to lead, but you don't have anything to, to lead them to, because you haven't built anything, then again, you can't solve any problems. And if you build something without leading people to it or learning why it works, then you're just building for no one. So all three of those kind of have to work together in order for you to succeed as an innovator. It's partially true. The other aspect of it is a lot of people don't want to take the risk because there is no roadmap for it. There mm. is no guarantee well, that you're going to come out alive. <laughs> I guess that's why we're doing uh, the series here to provide somewhat of a roadmap and help people along mm -hmm. the journey. So yeah, we're starting with our own roadmap. And then the more people we're able to help, we can kind of like try to replicate results and then make the roadmap more defined. But mm -hmm. I haven't seen a roadmap for, for this yet. There's a lot of people working on it though. How do you know if you're cut out to be an innovator, I guess? I think one of the first things that is a requirement is you have to have some sort of knowledge to share or at least work off of. It can really be anything. But honestly, I would recommend if you're going to be an innovator who wants to do this sustainably and also be able to build and lead people well, it should be something that you are interested in. You should start getting really, really good at something that you like and getting to the cutting edge of that. Because if you like it, then you're going to want to keep doing it. They have to, I would almost say like obsess over it for a while. Yeah. Like yeah. when we started YouTube years ago, we obsessed over it. <laughs> I remember those days when we literally just woke up and went to sleep and all we did for the entire 16 hours of being awake was just try to learn YouTube. We would just do like little sprints of like deep learning YouTube stuff and then deep learning learning stuff and then deep learning how to how to build stuff. And it's like, you have to have somewhat of a craving to learn and then actual self-reliance to, to go and learn those things, right? The first things you want to have are being very passionate about what you're trying to learn mm -hmm. and then being very knowledgeable of what you're trying to learn. That's definitely not enough. A third one should be how much it is impacting other people. Mm. And that's a very, very big component of it because how much it impacts other people dictates whether or not you can make a living out of it. Yeah, so I think that's where I, I, we can keep returning to this like this, this Venn diagram here. But that's what you brought with the people part is the leader part. It's like mm -hmm. to learn and obsess about something in the learner quadrant. But in order to understand if it is actually valuable for other people, you have to be a leader. You have to be a thought leader in, in what you do, which means sharing that expertise that you have publicly. Any kind of media is like the best way to get feedback on whether what you're learning is actually something that people care about and what people mm -hmm. vibe with and what people would follow you for. So yes, yeah. you have to learn, be obsessed with learning, but also be obsessed with finding what relatability, I guess, is that what we're trying to say? Basically just have to be a leader and share. Yeah. yeah, because I was thinking about the first two things we talked about, like you could be very passionate about virtual reality. You could be really, really talented and knowledgeable about it to the point where you build like Google Glasses, the first version or something, mm -hmm. but it didn't really change many people's lives. It just quickly died away. That's just an example of having no relatedness, having no impact in what you're innovating on. It just reminds me a lot of the Ikigai Venn diagram. It's like when you're innovating on something, it should be something that you're actually good at or you're proficient in. Be some, something that you're passionate about and it should be something that impacts other people because mm -hmm. then it makes profit. Profit is just like a measure of how much it impacts people. Those three, I, I say, that are the requirements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think all three of those are fit nicely in here, actually. Okay, so let's talk about mindset really quickly, because not everyone is cut out to be an innovator. And if you mm -hmm. are, then this is the type of mindset that you should uh, start thinking about. I'm just going to write mindset at the top. This is actually huge. Like mindset is something that it was always been hard for me to think about because mm -hmm. it was so hard to measure. So 
the first mindset I think is sounds kind of weird, but is courage. Mm. If you don't okay. have courage, I don't think you can be an innovator. Is that a mindset? I guess it is, huh? Yes. <laughs> It's like I, I, it I was growing up reading like all these fiction stories and like knights have courage or like, mm-hmm. you know, if you're in Gryffindor, yeah. then your you're, you're defining trait is bravery. Like in Harry Potter, it's like, what does that have to do with anything? Like I'm not fighting yeah. demons or stuff like that. But actually, oh. like deep down, courage is probably the most important mindset to have or like trait to have in a person here. And you have to overcome so many different fears of things. Mm-hmm. Fear of, I mean, fear of failure is a huge one. And I still struggle with this all the time. Imposter mm-hmm. syndrome, fear of just putting yourself out there. Mm-hmm. Like fear of making content, fear of being on camera. If you're trying to be a thought leader in that way, fear of writing mm-hmm. your ideas, fear of express expression. Like you have to be comfortable with voicing your most honest opinions, Mm -hmm. even when people disagree with you, Mm -hmm. especially in our society when it's so easy to get canceled or easy to make enemies Mm -hmm. online. If you don't have the courage to do these things, you're not going to reach people. I totally agree. I never really thought about that way. I was going to say like one of the mindsets was just growth, a growth mindset, Mm -hmm. which is leaning into challenges. But it sounds like courage is kind of the same thing that you want to lean into challenge and lean yeah. into uncertainty totally is a useful mindset to to adopt when you said courage the first thing that came to my mind was um was that scene in lord of the rings where mary is about to ride <laughs> into battle <laughs> the courage for your friends for courage scene, for your friends scene. well that's yeah. literally what innovator does the courage for your community <laughs> right you courage need for to your people lean into that so yeah it's definitely someone who's willing to take a risk i think that's what courage comes down to is willing to take a risk into something that's uncertain the second mindset is i would say you said growth mindset which i totally agree with but mm-hmm. i'll just take it a step further mm-hmm. and make it more specific and i will call it craftsmanship so the mindset of a person who is very obsessed with craftsmanship is just someone who is trying to get as good as they can. A lot of people call this pursuit of excellence. Pursuit of excellence. Actually, I'm not even sure I spelled that right. But anyways, craftsmanship is a person who is constantly trying to get better at their craft. And I read about this in Cal Newport's book, So Good They Can't Ignore You. And Mm -hmm. he framed it in a way that just resonated with me so much. He said, there's two ways that you can approach the world with a craftsman mindset or with a passion mindset. And while both are very useful, the passion mindset tends to look at the world as what does the world have to offer me? Because I'm the one who is looking for my passion. I'm the one who is looking for what I need. Whereas the craftsman mindset is coming at it from the complete opposite, is what do I have to give to the world? Yeah, I like that. What gift do I have to give? What knowledge do I have to give? And how can I get better at it so that I can give that gift? And when he put it that way, it made so much sense to me and that that is the growth mindset. So I would say if you want to think about this path, you have to always think about deliberate practice and lifelong learning. How do you use those two sub mindsets to make your your craft better so that you can help more people? And last one, Talking about how to help people, I think that service is a very important mindset mm-hmm. to have. For sure. You're always looking to benefit others, always looking to improve people's life. And now that I'm looking at this, it just looks very much like the Venn diagram that we have on the first page. I'm trying right. to draw a handshake here. I don't know how to draw a handshake. Looks like a fist bump. But, <laughs> sure. Which is fine. It's close. Yeah. So it sounds like, if anything, we just attach this one up here to. What is this? This would be leader, yeah, like a leader or a creator, thought leader, influencer. Mm-hmm. Takes courage, having the courage to talk about an idea or mm-hmm. get people to buy into an idea, or just lead people, on it. lead yeah. people into the unknown. That's what people craftsmanship do. This is definitely the learning one. Yeah, craftsmanship is about learning and Obsessing. continually. It's obsessing. Services, mm-hmm. uh, if you're an entrepreneur without a service mindset, then I don't think you're going to succeed. That's very entrepreneurial. You have to build something for people mm-hmm. to help solve them solve problems. Product. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, I guess so now that we're like... 
into the you could probably put those in here somewhere <laughs> if you yeah. want to I never it's actually like saw it this way, but now that we're talking it out and visualizing it, they're mm-hmm. just constantly reiterating these three these three identities, which mm-hmm. makes so much sense. So, Talked all this about like what a person, what an innovator is, why you want to become an innovator, what uh-oh. it takes, but what exactly do you do? Like if someone's listening and mm-hmm. they're thinking, what is the very first step I should take after I finish mm-hmm. listening to this, or what yeah. are the first few steps? What does my path ahead look like? Yeah, so I came across a path in this book that I was reading. So. His book is called Expert Secrets. Like you're trying to become an expert at something. And, you know, like obviously having expertise and authority, knowledge is is part of the innovator mindset. So you start as a dreamer. You have this big idea and you have this dream to to make an impact and and change people's lives. So the first thing you do is you, once you identify who you're trying to help and identify like generally what niche or subject area that you're interested about, you become a reporter. And if you spend time on the internet, you see this all the time podcasters are just inviting experts onto their podcast so that they can report. Like, this is what the experts say. And the thing about the reporter is that they are looking for information from every single perspective. So like when you're in school, like in in the traditional education system, and you're taking like, I don't know, biology class, like your biology class has one teacher, right? But the reporter mm-hmm. is trying to bring in like as many biology teachers as possible and seeing mm-hmm. the differences in ideas. And for themselves, they're trying to construct their own viewpoint of how of, of the big picture. So I think reporting okay. is is a is an important part. And so okay. those first two phases, the dreamer and the reporter, that is like you're in your growth phase. You're like coming up. Maybe you start like a podcast, maybe you start a little YouTube channel, teaching people what you find. Or maybe you start a newsletter, you start a little Twitter, you start writing about the things that you learn. But all these things you're learning on the way, it's like the sawdust, right? So these mm-hmm. things that you can share. But I don't want to go on that tangent. So yeah. the growth phase will take some time. That is when you need to start learning. Once you finish or feel like you have a good grasp of the information, you start frameworking things together. You start mind okay. mapping or tree noting or whatever you want to say. You become a framework creator. That's the next part. So from reporter, that's, that's what it's called. Yeah, it's called framework creator. <laughs> okay. So framework creator. Okay. There we go. You see that framework creator. Gotcha. Okay. Sure. So uh, kind of like what, what we did draw? with yeah. with um, study quest. You can draw. Yeah, kind of like what we did with study gonna, quest. Gonna There's just so that. many ways that you can teach a student how to study and get better mm-hmm. grades. And there's so many frameworks that you can use. And mm-hmm. we just combine a bunch of the frameworks that we learned into our own way. And then we tested it on our audience to see mm-hmm. what works. That's the next thing you do. And the framework creator is when you create your own frameworks, your own like IP and your own way of doing things, that is mm-hmm. like your first step into contributing to the industry. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it kind of makes sense. Like a lot of the people who we really admire, look up to have created some intellectual or proprietary property that is like uniquely theirs. Mm-hmm. But like, I guess James Clear is a good example, but he came up with like the four, he like really commoditized the habit loop, like Tiago Forte did his whole para. Uh, David Allen has his whole GTD system. Yeah, and James Clear innovated on things that already existed. Like mm-hmm. Charles Duhigg already had his frameworks and mm-hmm. BJ Fogg already had his frameworks. Right. And all the people, all the other habit experts before James Clear. But he mm-hmm. made his own framework. Same with Tiago Forte. There was like yeah. Sanke Ahrens and there's Nicholas Luhmann. Like there's people who already had their own frameworks. I guess, yeah, what we're saying is an innovator is not about trying to come up with something completely original. Mm-hmm. It is remixing yeah. ideas together to make something simple, unique, and that will appeal to a different subset of people, right? That's what being a leader is. Some people are going to vibe more with our way of teaching, Mm -hmm. study skills. Some people Mm -hmm. are going to vibe more with someone else's way of study um, study skills. But what we know about people, like, um, just like also again, going back to like human psychology and nature, is that if you like music, you don't just listen to one musician <laughs> right mm-hmm. it's like if i like a genre of music i probably listen to like five six seven artists in that same category when you go to like a concert too there's usually like two openers who are similar to the the main headliner so mm-hmm. people like related things so mm-hmm. if you're afraid that you're like all these ideas are already made it's like no there's like 
people follow and like a lot of very related and similar ideas. And so there's nothing wrong with like just having your take on it because mm -hmm. just like music, people might like that more than the other one. So, right. No, no, that's perfect. No. And, um, it's all about contribution. So in cinema, there is uh, Steven Spielberg, right? Uh, uh -huh. Or George Lucas. They made movies a long time ago where mm -hmm. you don't have a lot of like um, graphic technology. You don't have a lot of CGI. And so they actually mm -hmm. built like they he, they built R2-D2 and they built like Jaws, like they built a freaking mechanical mm -hmm. shark. Yeah. But nowadays, like I saw like the John Favreau like documentary of making the Mandalorian, like you could just stand in a room mm -hmm. and you can just create whatever the hell environment you want around you. You saw that mm -hmm. oval, that spinning room. It's yeah. like it was ridiculous, but the mm -hmm. core, the core um, concept is still there. Storytelling mm -hmm. needs to still be there. Directing mm -hmm. still needs to be there. All the creative energy still needs to be there, but it's a different time now. So mm -hmm. that is the importance of contribution is like you're contributing to the space in mm -hmm. relevance and context to your, your time now. Right. Your experiences, so like your, your experiences, personal journey, your, the unique technology that exists now, the, mm -hmm. how people are living right now. So yeah. the, the thing that the big light bulb for me is that I was thinking like, how do I contribute? Like everything has already been thought. Everything has already mm -hmm. been done with like studying, but no, it hasn't. like it hasn't, <laughs> it hasn't. Like, things are, things are always changing. You and just haven't got to the cutting. You just haven't gotten to the cutting edge yet. To the very exactly, yeah. So that is what it is to be like a framework creator. What does the framework creator go on to then? Once they've like created something original, a new idea, you write, novel you perspective. Should write contribution there next to grow too, by the way. But yeah, yeah. So after the framework creator, um, you become a servant. The the picture here is kind of funny. Is like is a waiter so, with like a dish. Sir, so it's called okay. servant. Yep. That's the last part. That's the last one. Yep. Okay. Well, there's one okay. more actually. There's one more after oh. that. But oh shoot! Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Maybe uh, erase. Uh, Servant, move no, it a little just, bit closer. I'm just gonna shrink them all. Or shrink it. Yeah. Yeah. So contribution has three, three gotcha. phases. Okay. So what's a servant do now? A servant is a person who changes people's lives. So you can mm. sit in your office all day and you can just theory craft and come up with all these frameworks, but it doesn't mean anything if your frameworks mm. don't have evidence to support that it works. You haven't tested it on people and mm -hmm. you haven't gotten people real results. Yeah. That's you why you see like to a result. Exactly. That's why you see like people are always considering online courses as scams because you can just throw information out there. But if your course doesn't actually get people results, then people are going to feel like they got scammed. Mm -hmm. You have to actually take the time to go talk to your students, figure out how to transform them and figure out how to make their lives better with your frameworks. Because mm -hmm. your frameworks don't give results, then they're just useless frameworks. It's just theory crafting, basically. Mm -hmm. What picture do I want to put for serve? Maybe I'll draw some eggs and bacon. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Not a plate. Get served here. Okay. Get served. So, so yeah. serving is now trying to translate this original idea that you had and seeing how it actually helps people. Okay. You have to help people. You have to change people's lives. That's where your profit comes in and that's where your impact comes in. Right. So yeah, after a servant, then you become the expert. You're an expert because you have the knowledge from all the reporting that you've done. You have clarified your knowledge because you built frameworks and you have wisdom because you've seen people change through your frameworks and you've helped them along the way. You have firsthand experience. So this nice. is from Russell Brunson's Expert Secrets, but I think it totally applies to the innovator, innovator path because this is about knowledge, but the innovator has so much more that you have to add to this path. Like how do you distribute your knowledge, right? Mm. Like yeah. customer success, how do you actually measure transformation and repeat those results? There's like mm. other pathways, but this is just, this is like the knowledge pathway. And I think this mm -hmm. is a good this is a good framework to start thinking about. I like this framework a lot. I think it makes a lot of sense. Also just like kind of seeing parallels in our own in our own journey with entrepreneurship and becoming what we hope to be innovators ourselves or to be recognized as one. Why don't you talk about how our journey reflected this? Because I think it's pretty interesting. 
Like at one point we were dreamers because we were able to change our lives with like the power of learning changed our lives, right? Learning mm-hmm. science, productivity, self-improvement, that kind of stuff. So yeah. we were dreamers in that we think if that if these things were able to change our lives, then we can use this to help change other people's lives. That's where you start. That is like yeah. the spark of the dream. And so mm-hmm. going into reporter mode, we started consuming everything that we could find. Reading like, I think the first thing that I read was probably the whole way was probably like Deep Work by Cal Newport or Atomic Habits by James Clear. It's probably one of those two. For learning. Um, For like, yeah, learning and Mm self-improvement. And then we started reading like articles, we started reading like books about it. Like Make a Stick was one of the first ones by Peter Brown that I read. Um, Yeah, what I read, I read uh, stuff. Barbara Oakley, Learning How to Learn. Yeah. Um, Daniel Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. Moonwalking with Einstein. But yeah, we're gathering as many ideas as we could Mm -hmm. from different uh, experts who had already uh come up with these ideas. Yeah. We also met Justin Sung and had some like conversations with him. Mm -hmm. Um, We met like a bunch of educational startup founders and had a a lot of conversations. (laughs) We started one ourselves. There you go. Like a note taking. Yeah. We talked so to a lot, of, a lot uh, of learning people. experts in different fields. Went on a bunch of medical well. podcasts, stuff like that. So like, mm-hmm. yeah, we we tried to condense everything into frameworks. That was the next thing. And you can mm-hmm. see if, you, if you're taking our study quest course, you can see all the different frameworks that evolved over time. Mm-hmm. I saw in our discord that um, someone posted the tea tree. <laughs> you remember that framework? Yeah. That was one of the earlier, early ones that we came up with. And over yeah, time, it like just kind of evolved. Year one. <laughs> exactly. Year one. Uh-huh. And over time, that it evolved into something else, and now it's uh, the TREE acronym. Mm-hmm. But the reason why it evolved is because of the next phase, Servant. Once mm-hmm. we had our frameworks and we actually went and applied it to our students and saw what was working and what wasn't working and doing tons of like exit interviews and stuff like that, that's how we knew, like, oh, this framework would do so much better if we just added it to this framework. We combined them and we tested again. We iterated over mm-hmm. and over and again. Mm-hmm. So um, framework creating and being a servant, I guess, just goes hand in hand. Like that cycle just iterates into itself over and over. Mm-hmm. And at some point, eventually, we I forget when it was, but there was like, for most of our journey, we're like, we don't want to be called learning experts. Like, it's kind of a cringy, like, we're just, we're the guide, not the guru, right? Yeah, but that's Which, because we were only, we, were, we weren't here, we weren't there yet. We hadn't reached yeah. the point. So there was a lot of imposter syndrome leading mm-hmm. up to that point. But I think when we started seeing results and we started changing people's lives and the students came back to us and showed us the results then Mm -hmm. it was a positive feedback loop and it made us feel like yeah maybe we are good at what we do Mm -hmm. and at that point when we have that confidence calling ourselves learning experts we have the confidence to actually lead people Mm -hmm. and um, that's what we're trying to do now just scaling up our our programs and and leading people to like a a better way of being productive and and learning but i wanted to circle back to one idea that could look kind of scary with this framework here is it looks like it takes a long time and it does take a long time. Everything good. I was going to say, it does do take a long time. Takes a long time. But the difference between something like this and something like the traditional education system is that the rewards and the impact that you can have start to happen as early as reporter. You can start mm-hmm. impacting people's lives. You can start building authority. You can start to connect and form relationships very early on. Whereas on the traditional education system, it's like you can't really do anything until you get the degree, right? Yeah. Like what's an example? Well, example for us from from our own journey that we just talked about right there, like from idea to reporter, we already had we already had started a YouTube channel and our YouTube channel oh, was growing. Like making content. Yeah. And we were starting to make content already. And at this point we were already generating profit. It wasn't a mm-hmm. substantial amount, but like you can you can make incremental impact as you go up this ladder here it doesn't have to be like it's going to take me 10 years and then suddenly i'm going to have like um all of this all of this freedom it's a slow process but it compounds over time unlike with something like the traditional system where it's like nothing happens until you finish you know that's true like just drawing from our own life we couldn't practice in the hospital until we had our mds yeah i and couldn't all I, those years you should not make it just anything. paying You're paying the whole time. This is a route where it might not be much at first, especially if you're just getting started and you haven't reported on a whole bunch of things. You haven't really uh, developed your skills to lead, persuade, attract attention. 
Mm -hmm. than your following on social media or anything. It might be a little bit smaller, but as you get better, as you improve your skills, it does compound. Mm -hmm. And having a strong brand as an expert with your own IP, like a framework and being able to serve people, that reputation as an innovator is so much stronger than any degree you can get from school. Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, like what people really care about, they don't care about what degrees you have. And I think more, more and more now, it's like employers, business owners, we're not hiring people based on degrees. They're hiring people based on what they can do. And the path of an innovator is allowing for is a way, an opportunity to build like a public resume. It's the projects that they've, they've done. It's the, the problems they've solved. It's the frameworks they've created. It's how mm -hmm. big their their audience is, their personal brand is, based on how well they can execute on these three things here, on how well they can build, lead, and learn. So that is just something that is tangible. You know, like people can see that and like, okay, like I understand the value and the worth of this person. Even if you are someone who went to an Ivy League college, there's like 500 people who graduate Harvard as a whatever major. It's like, you're all the same person. <laughs> it's kind of hard to like differentiate. You're not a one-on-one, -on -one, but this is how you become the couture, right? This is how you become one of one by solving mm -hmm. a unique problem through a unique lens with your experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you are a student at Harvard studying whatever subject that 500 other students are doing, then the way that you yeah. set yourself out is you start reporting. Like if you're like a computer yeah. science major in Harvard, mm -hmm. start doing podcasts or making videos and talking to experts, reading books mm -hmm. and building out your portfolio of knowledge in public part-time. Mm -hmm. You can do it as a student. And then when you go out there into the world, once mm -hmm. your portfolio has started getting traction, you start making a little bit more money, you start getting more attention start mm -hmm. making more impact on people, then you can see clearly, oh, this is a path that I can take. I don't have to go into the traditional mm -hmm. nine to five job if I don't want to, right? Now you right. have options because yeah. your public portfolio is its capital that you've invested in since you were a student. So that's mm -hmm. definitely the first step you gotta think about. For sure. Yeah, and I don't mean at all to say that like getting a Harvard degree isn't valuable. There, There is a lot of value in that brand name. Yeah, but there's leverage. It, it's, not, it's not what creates the one of one. It can add to being one of one. Like you could be, the person who has this framework and also has a degree from Harvard. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think that's, that makes it better. But it's <laughs> like, I guess at the end of the day, it's like, it's nice to have, but it's not necessary. No one's going to say that like having a degree from Harvard isn't nice, but it's mm -hmm. unnecessary for this path. Like for us entering the study space, there are a lot of students making content and teaching studying. Mm -hmm. But there are very few that are actually doctors or lawyers or people who have gone to like a rigorous graduate program like us. So we were able mm -hmm. to stand out from them. But even in our little yeah. circle, there are a lot of doctors who do studied content. So how sure. do we stand out? For sure. There's two of us, there's two brothers, and mm -hmm. we specialize our content to be a little bit more gamification and anime. And we just try to make mm -hmm. it a little different. That's called just remixing a bunch of things that make you unique. What is like a milestone? that would come from each of these phases. I don't know if you have one or if Russell Brunson has one. Cause I was just looking at this. I'm like, this could be dreamers. Obviously like, you know, you just, you have an idea. Huh? Reporters like now Got probably starting a personal brand because now or you're starting a brand. to report and share something. I'll just, I'll just put personal brand. It's fine. I think people mm. understand that. Okay. But yeah, reporting is just like now, like this is probably the step where you started to share ideas, at least created content, media assets, something like that, YouTube social media, but you are starting to report and gather interests in this idea, in this space. Mm -hmm. This is probably where you are now. This is like probably now like where you've created a framework and now you want to MVP. What that means is like you have a minimum viable product to mm -hmm. start helping people solve a solution based on your understanding. Because a framework is only val like only useful if it can actually help someone achieve some kind of solution or result. So at mm -hmm. this point, you're probably like testing it on a few people, maybe like handful. Like when we when we first did study quests, like our initial group was like 40 people, right? We didn't want to like put out um, a really bad product. So we tested it with 40 people. We were like very intimate, got a lot of feedback. And then afterwards, once your framework is like established and good to go. You have a product that is getting somewhat reliable results, or that's the goal at least. Yeah, I'll call it product refinement. Yeah. At this point, you are starting to get results for people and you're like improving it slowly and serving more and seeing who who likes the eggs and the, and the bacon that you serve. And then once you've achieved the same result for a lot of people and the results are really good, then this is the point where you can start to scale mm -hmm. um, as an expert, mm -hmm. keep pushing the cutting edge to uh, yeah. to serve this many people. And so I guess I'll just and want to write those down to just share our journey specifically with building mm -hmm. StudyQuest and how and yeah. we're thinking about it. 
It's useful. Let me add two more things to this, actually. Okay. What we talked about was between the servant and, and creator frame and framework creator, it mm-hmm. is a flywheel of iteration. So mm. just so people have an expectation, like you'd be spending a lot of time between these areas because you're trying like to refine, yeah, you're trying to refine your product and find something that works. It's going to take a lot of deep work. There's another wheel too in the in the mm-hmm. growth phase between dreaming and and reporting. And a lot of people get stuck here. Like what niche do I go after? You know, what is my niche? And you start mm-hmm. by just doing a lot of things, a lot of different topics, a lot of different videos, content until you mm-hmm. find something that aligns with what you like and what your audience likes. Like I would say that your niche is you, obviously, but mm-hmm. it is a constant wheel of iteration between idea here and as well. reporting. There's yeah, also so right you there. iterate here as well. Yeah, you iterate there as well. You're iterating what your niche is and, and what you're trying to learn. And when we started mm-hmm. off, we started making medical content, we made study content, we made mm-hmm. music, we made so many things that we made. And mm-hmm. Eventually, it, we landed on productivity and learning, and that yeah. was through a lot of iteration. But the problem is, mm-hmm. a lot of people get stuck in that in that ideation phase and in going into reporter because they freeze and they think that you need to have a well defined niche before you can move on. Mm-hmm. And it's the complete opposite. You have to keep moving on to realize your niche, and it, right. it is a flywheel yeah. at that point. So. Yeah, those two totally flywheels, I think there's expectations that need to be set there. It's, it's going to take a lot of time in those two areas specifically. Yeah, scale is a different game. <laughs> yeah, but over here is uh, something that we're still trying to figure out and piece together what it means. Cool. So this is the path that we see for innovators who want to achieve some kind of freedom doing stuff that they like with the freedom to do it wherever, whatever it is with whoever they want. It's a it's a cool opportunity and I'm excited to explore more what it looked like for us and how to break this down further to help someone get started on their own path. Mm-hmm.